Okay, guys, what's up? I hope you're having a great day today. Now, today's uh, first, 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 first. Um, I know you guys are, most of you guys are longtime listeners of the show. Thanks. If you're new, welcome. Hey, I'm glad you made it. Um, this is an exciting show. We talk with top producing real estate agents, coaches, and just generally, man, we talk about entrepreneurship through the lens of an agent. If you don't sell real estate, no problems. Um, all the stuff we talk about are very tactical, strategic, boots on the ground, ways to build your business. And look, man, I've listened to a lot of podcasts out there. Um, and even the top rated ones, I mean, I know a lot of those guys personally, I'm not going to say their names. The content is not that great. Um, this one, I'm confident you'll enjoy. Now, today's today's episode um, is uh, it's kind of a twofer. I've not done this before, but um, um, I actually did these yesterday. Um, to, this is airing on a Friday. I did these yesterday on Thursday. Um, and, it, and I look. Normally, these interviews are about an hour. I only had 30 minutes. So uh, I'm giving you two of them. And I'm going to kind of give, and I did these back to back. So I'm kind of uh, giving you a taste of how my day looks like. Uh, my first interview was, uh, was a pretty, um, the audio was not that great. The guy was on a cell phone. Um, but this guy just sold his business for $30 million. This guy's under 40 built this fantastic, I mean, I think he's like, like 33, 34, built this fantastic business, literally just sold it for $30 million after seven years, started it in 07, uh, well, eight years, I guess, 07 to 2015. Um, and I'm not saying that's his revenue. I'm saying that's what he cashed out. So we talk about, you know, not necessarily tactics in that interview of how to build your business, but we talk about how to spot opportunity. Um, and he was a real estate agent and uh, saw a new opportunity, kind of jumped on it. So how to spot opportunity, um, how, how when you do spot an opportunity, how to go out and tackle it and then quickly, quickly build it. So, so we, do, we do get tactical there. Um, the second interview, uh, well, you know, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. You listen to the first one, and I'll give you an intro to the second one in a minute or after this one. <laughs> Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Yeah. Real quick, guys, just a little bit of housekeeping. As you know, uh, my Twitter handle is at Super Agents Live. Uh, I'd love to meet you in Twitterville. Um, the hashtag for the show is Unpack That Idea. So go ahead, tweet it out, use that hashtag, and that's a big follow train, man. You'll, you'll, I'll follow you. A lot of people follow you. Um, secondarily, uh, look, um, this show. Uh, for the last two years has fundamentally been free and we'll keep it free, but it is supported through our radio arm. If you want listing leads, listing leads, um, radio, that's it. Radio, it works. And by the way, in this episode, we're going to talk about radio. So you can go to realestateradioexperts.com, check out my videos, uh, fill out the getting started uh, sheet, um, or just go to superagentslive.com. We have a dominate with radio tab. All right. Um, a couple things that, that we're working on right now um, to help you guys. One is we're creating a backstage pass uh, program, which ba- it's, look, you, it's a paid for program. So it's like the first paid thing we're going to launch. But basically, it, I want to kind of give you guys access to my, to my guests. So, so, you know, uh, let's say I'm going to have Bob Corcoran on the show or I'm going to have some other top producer. I'm going to let you guys know up front who it is. Um, I'm going to let you guys get, you know, we're going to fire a, a go-to meeting uh, uh, live video thing. And you guys are going to be there. So you guys can ask me questions. You can ask my guests questions and, uh, and, and just generally participate. So I think that would be really cool. And then we are in the middle and, and not too far from, from, from completing a done-for-you email big box. So a lot of times, you know, email marketing is awesome. Hopefully you have a list. If you don't, most people go, geez, I don't know what to say. Well, we're going to solve that for you. So anyhow, that's it. Let's get to the episode. I hope you like it.
Today on the show, um, we're doing something a little bit different. I'm excited to have today's guest. Now, today's guest is a serial entrepreneur, um, and uh, he's built a real estate company a little bit differently. He has a rental company. It's called Rentals Where Rental Warehouse. Um, he's had massive, massive growth. Uh, I think right now he's ranked number three fastest growing uh, real estate companies. I'm thrilled to welcome Brenton Hayden. Hey, Brenton, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. No problems. So, look, Brenton, I'm, I'm, I really want to get into what you've done, how you did it. But uh, look, you, you know, I read somewhere that uh, when you were younger, you, a headhunter told you, "Hey, look, being a young person, the only way to make six figures is real estate." So you jumped into real estate. However, instead of, I think you may have started selling, but I, I want to know how you started renting. Um, di- how did you see the opportunity? You know, you're right. Um, I was a corporate executive at a young age with a big company named Kellogg's, and I did very well for myself there. But uh, after some mistakes, I was actually terminated. And uh, I did go to a headhunter and said, how do I, um, uh, you know, pursue this sort of income, this sort of experience? And he did point me into real estate. At that time, uh, I didn't know nothing about it, didn't have anybody in the family that did it. So uh, I looked up who the biggest, best agent was in my market, and I found a guy named Jonathan. And uh, after one of the weirdest and longest interview processes ever, I was able to get a job as his buyer's agent. And it was there that I got the idea, helping buyers buy investment properties, uh, that uh, a leasing company, or eventually we become a leasing and management company, was what uh, Minnesotans needed, and, and little did I know what America needed, and, and I was about to time it very, very correctly. So I spent about six months there learning how to represent investors. And in buying, helping these investors, both low and high profile, buy homes, I found that there was one constant need, dependable, standardized um, leasing and management services. But at first, um, they were desperate to find somebody who knew how to lease their properties effectively, quickly, and was motivated to do that. It was kind of, uh, at the time, something that was below most agents, and they didn't want to do it. I mean, the market was thriving, so why why work on a $1,000, $2,000 commission when you can go, you know, sell or buy a house and earn in much, much more. So I was kind of doing the dirty work or the busy work of the real estate agents, but I was gobbling it all up uh, all at once. And it, it turned out to be pretty fruitful for me. And it also uh, turned into what would be a business that I later sold to a private equity group here just a few weeks ago. Yep. I heard about that. And, and, and just, just, just to kind of set the table, um, uh, what were your revenues last year? I mean, give us a sense of how, how far you've come since, you know, tw- 2007. So, you know, it was just me, right? I'm working at actually kind of a small boutique brokerage uh, called Counselor Realty, which is only in Minnesota. And, um, you know, this Jonathan Zabrocki guy went on his own, and it was at that time I decided I was going to go on my own, too, and pursue being a, a property manager or a professional landlord for hire. Uh, so we went from, you know, uh, not, not having any experience in being a zero-person company except for me to uh, when I sold it this year, uh, we were sold over a $30 million business, um, and we had offices in 28 states managing 10,000 rental properties and had about $2 billion worth of rental properties under assets, and we did that in just seven and a half years. Wow. Wow. And I, I know that timing, you know, with, with every business, you know, timing has a lot to do with it, and I, and I want to get into timing for you later, but what was that thing, Brenton, that you recognized? I'm still a little bit hazy how you felt, uh, you know, you launched in Minnesota, but what were those triggers that you said this, you know, being a professional landlord for investors was, was a needed thing. What were those triggers? Well, I couldn't, I couldn't find anyone to refer these really great investors to get help for leasing and management in Minnesota. I just, they, I'd help them buy an investment property and they said, great, can you help me lease it, manage it now? No, I can't. I don't know how to do that. Well, I'd look around, I'd, I'd ask questions. There wasn't a reputable company. There wasn't a nationwide company. There wasn't anybody with a value proposition. So that was glaringly obvious that there was a need. Uh, also, real estate agents felt it was beneath them, so nobody really wanted to do it. Yeah. Um, it was un- rather unregulated at that time, about seven and a half years ago. Nobody really you know, permitted rental properties. There wasn't a lot of rental rules and restriction uh, other than some national guidelines. So it was really kind of like, uh, um, you know, if you're familiar with the term blue and red ocean, it's very blue ocean yet in a very big industry like real estate. So I just saw an opportunity to become the best damn leasing agent at first. I'm just going to become a real estate agent that helps people lease. And that's what everybody desperately wanted more than anything. Cause a lot of people still will choose to manage the property on their own. 
But uh, it was about two years into being the best Sam leasing agent that we decided to open up the management division, which also became somewhat, somewhat very lucrative uh, for us and something people also wanted. And that was listening to those, those clients that we leased homes for for two years, saying, you know, we really only wish we could get a really affordable management company that basically did the four things really well, which were collect rent, enforce the lease, um, uh, collect rent, enforce the lease, coordinate the maintenance, and do the accounting. And I said, okay, well, that seems simple enough. I can do those four things. So I literally built a management company uh, that had a price for 79 bucks a month, no matter the property, no matter the rent price. We would do the accounting, we would enforce the lease, um, and, and do those other four items. It coordinate the maintenance, so on and so forth. So 79 bucks a month, $2.54 a day, wow. and people went nuts for it. We went from you know, a zero-dollar company to almost a million dollars our first year in profit. Um, it was just gangbusters, and it was just me. And at the time, I was uh, a guy driving around in the car with a couple of assistants helping me uh, schedule showing, list appointments, et cetera. And now we, when we sold the company, we had over 250 people in the network and, and 100 and some plus employees. That's amazing. And, and I just want to point out, if people aren't, if you don't, if you're not, you know, I, I'm in San Diego, and uh, so you guys don't have a, a, a footprint here. But so I just want to point out to everybody, what Brenton has and, or what he just sold, the company Renters Warehouse is a franchise. So if you're out there slinging real estate and you, uh, you, know, you think maybe this is, you're more suited to this, uh, you reach out to Winner's Warehouse and see what you know. See if it's right for you. So, okay. So yeah, indeed. He, here's here's what. So you start. You see a, a problem. Um, you build a solution. Um, how, help me. I, I want to know why you kept pushing after. You know, you make a million dollars in profit. I mean, you were a young kid. You make a million bucks. Isn't that enough? Like, what is in you, Brenton, that you said, no, no, no. I want to take this to ten, twenty, thirty million. Well, you know, um, that was really weird and unexpected. I didn't, you know, it was kind of like uh, I, I realized it after the fact, right? So I do my text at the end of the year, and I'm like, holy Christ, this, this thing really took, you know, granted we were busy, but we were making money. I didn't even have time to collect the money. So that was really, you know, kind of an after the fact thing, and, and that was a big aha, like, wow, this is, this, this, we're not even that good at this yet. In our first year, we're doing this. So it was, uh, it was rewarding. It was confidence uh, a booster. But, um, you know, from I, the reason I got into real estate in general was after a myriad of messy uh, firings as a young age. At, um, at, uh, I got fired from Kellogg's for making a mistake. Um, I worked at a real estate company, and he thought I was too entrepreneurial, so he fired me too. Um, so it was, it was a bit of inspiration and depression that fueled the next seven and a half years of my life. Uh, for example, uh, when I was laid off from Kellogg's in my real estate company, I was not homeless. I'm, I'm 20. I'm homeless. I'm living in my old mobile. I got, uh, I got an attitude problem, so I don't want to go back home and tell mom and dad I need to move in. So uh, in a fit of inspiration and depression, I got out a yellow notebook, and I wrote down seven pages back to front of what I stood for, what I stood against, what I wanted to be and what I didn't want to be, and the things that were important to me and that, and that weren't. It was, it was just a, a, a long emotional stream of consciousness. But it became my, my, my life's plan. It became my roadmap to, to success. And I, I carried that piece of paper around with me for five years until uh, a move actually misplaced it. I'll find it one day, and it'll be worth a lot more to me then when I find it. But yeah. um, that was it. I mean, it was this, it was, it, I harnessed this depression and inspiration because, you know, I heard a quote once, and it, it stuck with me. Inspiration is perishable. And, and when you have, in, when you're inspired and you're feeling inspired, you know, it's a good time to swear off the weekend and just harness that inspiration and get it down and start, start work on that project. And, and that's what I did. I, I took that motivation. I harnessed this plan. And then I said, you know what, what, what do I got to lose? Let's just go for it. And along the way, you know, I candidly, I don't, I never thought I would realize it because in that yellow notebook it said that I would retire when I was 27 with $7 million and after cash and I'd have these houses and I'd be able to retire my dad and, um, and I get, well, and I crunched the numbers. I did all of that. Well, you know, uh, uh, it felt real, but it felt, you know, like a dream, right? It was my dream. Well, a couple years in, even after my first year, when you kick out a million dollars in profit on something that, you know, as a guy who's, you know, a year earlier was living in his Oldsmobile showering at a park, and now you're kicking out a million in profit off an idea in a year. Well, that, that gave me fire in the belly. Um, that made it realize that this, this thing actually might happen and if I can keep play my cards right this will this will happen so every year after that the continued success was validation uh i, I want to tell you it wasn't easy and it wasn't without lots of mistakes and lots of issues but um 
you're able having that roadmap that I wrote was able to kind of benchmark success. It, it allowed me to, um, I don't know, uh, monitor, uh, monitor the traction towards my, my dream. It, it allowed me to know if I was making progress or not. And every time I was feeling down, I could look back at that and it would show me great progress, which would refill the tank and the fire in my belly. So that's where it all came from. Okay. And that's great. I mean, it's, but I think, th- uh, you know, there's something more here, Brenton, I think, because, because, Somehow, not only did you, you know, you, you, you create this massive success, but, but the, here's what I want to get at. So most people, when they start a real estate company, whether it's selling real estate or, or as you did rentals, you know, they, they go and they meet people and uh, they grow their email list. They, they do it in very typical fashion, right? Google pay-per-click. You somehow had the inspiration and had the courage to take some of that hard-earned million bucks and throw it into mass media, which is radio yep. and TV, so, so absolutely, and and from my understanding, Brenton, radio is the thing that really, really put you guys on the map. I mean, that's the thing that really, you know, up and to the right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, I, I kind of fell into it. So I met. I was in. Uh, you know, I had this real estate company. It's going fine, but I actually started a limousine company too at the same time. Um, and I bought these limousines out of uh, foreclosure. Uh, well, this woman owned a franchise of uh, it's a dating service called It's Just Lunch, and I had a partnership with my limousine company and her, where we would uh, you know donate limousines for for dates and charity events. Well, uh, I'm driving home from one of these events one night after we had sponsored a limo for actually Jack Nicholas, and um, the radio came on. It was It's Just Lunch endorsement commercial by none other than Glenn Beck, the third most listened to man in radio, endorsing this dating service for for my friend. I immediately picked up the phone and said, how in the heck did you get Glenn Beck to endorse your small business? And she told me about this media agency uh, in Minnesota, and basically just this woman who was just had connected to everybody. Her name was Tracy Collins. She worked with big clients. And so I called her up, and I begged and pleaded to get a meeting, and I told her I wanted to spend 3000 a month on radio. And she's like, you know, it's really nice, and I'll, I'll help you find somebody, but, you know, you're much too small for my type of business. Um, well, I persuaded her to take a meeting, and after she walked out of that meeting, she tells me this now, that she, she couldn't believe what she had heard, and she loved the idea so much, she, she became my personal account manager. And we put that 3000 to to, uh, to test with a Glenn Beck endorsement. Uh, she was able to introduce me and get me a meeting with Glenn Beck, and I was explaining my product, and he just loved it. Uh, so he became my first endorsement that year alone. Uh, we generated another million dollars off of the Glenn Beck radio spot that we played on a conservative talk radio station during his TV show or his radio show. Okay. So that's another light bulb. We're like, Oh, holy heck With that much money. So we'll get 3000 a month in we're taking out 10, 15,000 a month in commissions off this little advertisement. So it came to us. Why don't we put 20,000 a month into this? Let's reinvest some of the profit. We put more in, more came out. Well, then it became the idea. Why don't we get Sean Hannity? Why don't we get Rush Limbaugh? Why don't we try, um, sports athletes? Why don't we try local morning tacos on top four? And now we have dozens of professional spokespeople that use our product, love our product, endorse our product, and they blast it all over the radio waves. It's now our number one lead uh, acquisition source for Renner's Warehouse. And it, now there's a lot more to it than just putting a guy on the radio and, and asking him to promote your brand. Um, but we have a secret way of doing a secret sauce to radio that really works for us in a big, big way. And it is our number one lead source. It's something we spend uh, tens of millions of dollars on in the United States. We have an incredible relationship with uh, iHeartRadio and Cumulus and some of the biggest partners there who have even worked with us in the early stages doing paper performance radio. Wow. And we didn't even have the money to pay for radio sometimes, but they would say, why don't, if it works so well, why don't we just give you the radio and we'll, we'll pay, you pay us on performance? I mean, that's how good radio partners really have been to us. We've been fortunate that it works so well. Now, when I started another real estate company, a buy and sell company, and I, I actually just closed that down, three weeks ago, not because it was failing, but because we want to focus on Renner's Warehouse's corporate national expansion now with this private equity group. But I put it on the radio with spokespeople and, and not spokespeople, dud, terrible, it doesn't work. I do it for Renner's Warehouse, go to the busters. I can put it on any station, anywhere, and people love what I'm, what my product is. So it's not just, it's it, you got to have the right product too, you got to have the right strategy, but if, if, if you do... Radio is an amazing source to help you grow your business. I, I guarantee it. Yeah, no, no, and and I, 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 so I agree with you. And and I'll tell you, you know, all I do on this show is I talk with the top people in real estate, and there's a very, very clear cor- uh, correlation between the people who are doing 200 deals or more 
all those people have a radio or TV initiative. So, so it does, yep. it does work for those folks. I, it's, it's, it's curious to me that it didn't work for your buy and sell. Why do you well, think I that failed? Explain for you? that actually. Yeah. Um, you know, it did, but it's very different than what we experienced at Renner's Warehouse. So, uh, you know, at Renner's Warehouse, we're a high volume real estate brokerage. It, my Minnetonka, Minnesota location, I'll do 500 transactions a month with just 68 agents. It's a very high volume leasing business. And that's just that one location. But we generate those leads by the thousands a month, and that will turn into commissions within 30, 60, 90 days. The lead time in property management is very short. Now, real estate buy sell, the lead time is very long, and they have so many options to go with. And the value proposition as a traditional agent is somewhat much more difficult to present to a consumer than it is in the property management business. There's nobody like me in Renner's Warehouse. But in the real estate game, it's very hard to be different from everybody else other than just be a great real estate agent and have a, a special product with them. But Keller Williams, Cobalt Banker, you know, uh, um, Remax, they're generally damn near the same to the consumer. The agent is what makes the difference. Renner's Warehouse wanted to be different. We wanted you to hire the company, not the agent. And in real estate, you hire the agent, generally not the company. Right, okay. And so it, it, it's, a diff, it's apples and oranges. Granted, they're both fruits, right? But <laughs> it, it required a different strategy. So the same strategy that worked for one real estate business certainly didn't work for traditional real estate. So... I guess what I'm getting at is we must be doing something entirely different from those that are, have a secret sauce that do hundreds of deals in the real estate game from the secret sauce that we use that do thousands of deals in the property management game. Right, right, right. And, and, and you know, offline, I can tell you what that is. But so, so I'd love to hear it. Yeah. So I, I want to know, you know, so the timing, you know, I've done a bunch of companies and they've all been based on, a, you know, external timing event and you started this in 07 there you know it's amazing that in the world of real estate you know hundreds thousands of years old you know this thing right professional landlording didn't exist you know and you're the guy who can yeah, just that right. something it's amazing yeah. um so so the the cat's out of the bag right everybody knows about you everybody knows about the, you know your massive growth what what do you think the biggest vulnerability vulnerability for you guys is with you know a bunch of competition you know, springing out everywhere i just fixed it i just fixed it i was my own biggest vulnerability my my pocketbook could only go so far uh, on my on my income and wealth and, and management of the company i took it from 0 to 30 million and i got it to 28 different states um I just partnered with a, a guy who's uh, bought and sold over 120 companies, He's managed a multi-billion dollar private equity group in Beverly Hills for many years. He just acquired a control stake in Renner's Warehouse and, and, and took over control of Renner's Warehouse. His plan now is to open up 30 corporate offices in the next three years instead of franchising, and, and we'll put franchising on slow simmer. So we're still going to be franchising, but in smaller markets. But we're going to go to all the major top 30 markets in the country with corporate locations and millions of dollars in each to use our, our secret sauce and advertising and take what we've done so well at the corporate level and open our own shops. Um, that was our biggest vulnerability. We couldn't get to market share fast enough before our competitors started to, you know, enjoy the spoils of this industry too. Right. We're now the largest uh, professional land in the country. We want to keep that. Uh, and uh, I don't know that I could have kept it. I was doing a good job. I closed in on them. We came number one before I sold. But uh, I needed some extra firepower, and I just got it. In fact, uh, the guy who um, took over our company uh, has got some really notable investors, from Ronald Reagan's financial uh, policy advisors to a guy who invented uh, rentpayments.com. He's one of the largest digital processors of uh, rent payments in the country, too. Uh, uh, a, a guy on my board was a CEO of Verifone, a billion company for 12 years. So we now have expertise. We have a strategic partnership, and we have an unlimited bank account to become the the chapstick of property management, the Kleenex. We're going to become the professional landlords of rent estate. I don't even call it real estate because what you guys do in the real estate business is nothing like what we do in the rent estate business and vice versa. And so we're, we're, we're going to become the professional landlords of rent estate. Well, uh, and that's our that's our plan, and we couldn't do that without the money in the back, and we have that now. Yeah, so got it. Cap game over. Right, perfect. Okay, and, and capital is always a limiting factor. So, so one of the things I, I I wanted to ask you know I want I want to I'm going to ask you I'm going to do a bad thing as an interview and ask you two questions. But so first, earlier you 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 mentioned your price point seventy nine bucks. Now to me. That seems, you know, you're the only guy in town. You're the first guy in town. You've, you know, you've, you've, you've perfected the model. Why in the world wouldn't you come out with 274? Why was it like, why did you put such a low tag on it? Well, investors buy investment properties to cash flow. 
and I'm making a healthy, healthy income off 79 bucks a month because of the sophisticated technologies we invented and or acquired. Uh, we've, we've made a semi-automated process out of property management using sophisticated technology, and then we coupled that with expert human landlords. So we're a very human company that's highly sophisticated with pri- proprietary technology. It makes it so you can't compete with us. Um, and that's our secret sauce. So we're able to do it cheaper and better, and therefore we win. Um, now, we could raise our prices, and we do. In some markets, it's just more expensive to do business. And in South Florida, we have offices in Miami and Sunny Isles. They'll charge 100 bucks a month for property management because of the, you know, a rent of a 2,000-square-foot office space costs them six grand versus a rent of a 2,000-square-foot office space in Minnesota will cost you 1,000. So it's just more expensive to do business in some areas, so therefore we have to raise our prices. But 99 bucks is like our worst price. So, and even then, uh, that, that's going to beat most competitors out in the market. It's a flat fee because our job actually is easier on higher-end rentals than it is on lower-end rentals. So uh, a percentage-based fee we think is flawed. Uh, we think it's, it's greedy, so we don't do it. Um, we use a flat fee. We know, what the, we know what the job is. We tell you exactly what we're going to do. We're going to lease your home. We're going to warranty your tenant. We're going to collect your rent, enforce your lease, coordinate maintenance with our discounted vendors, and do all your accounting. And, uh, and if you have fears, we have three risk protection programs. We can protect you against property damage. We can guarantee the rent and we can cover all costs associated with eviction. So now we're not only catering to sophisticated investors that can choose the services they want. We're also catering to the everyday homeowner that never thought about renting that now can look at a company like ours and say, wow, they make it easy, fast and worry free. I'm just going to go with them and outsource this other town home that I had and move in with my girlfriend. Or I'm going to take that job in San Francisco instead of Minnesota. So we're catering to everybody. And that was, the, that was a big missing part. Most people did not want to work with one guy who had one investment property. Joe the plumber who bought a duplex and lives on the other side didn't want to man. Well, we'll help him. Most other companies won't. In fact, 96% of our clients have two homes or less. We yeah. don't really dabble in the big game because the big guys, they don't want us. They, they'll do it themselves. If they got 5,000 units, they'll hire a gang of people to do it. It's the people that have five units and under that are desperately in need of professional landlordship, and that's what we provide. Okay. And, and what, here's what I wanted to get to with pricing is, you know, certainly you put a, 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 you know, a $79. Look, I have a couple rentals. I never get the rent on time. I know like, I have one place that, that uh, it's probably 400 bucks under market. Um, but I just, I don't, you know, like I could benefit from your service, but, but here's my, here's, here's what I want to get at Brenton is you, you, you perfected the model. You came out with this flat fee. Um, could that is the real estate agent at large at risk for somebody, not you, but, but somebody like you to come in and do the same thing and, and say, instead of selling your house and we're going to charge a, a, a straight 6%, come in, flat fee it, greatly reduce the prices and change the world of, of real estate for agents. You know, I actually owned a franchise of E flat fee real estate. That tanked. Um, I bought it in the time when everybody, the real estate market was collapsing, their equity was collapsing, and I thought to myself, I'm going to be a brilliant business. People are going to need to preserve equity. They're going to rely less on a real estate agent. And I went knee-deep, and I went and acquired two companies, e Flat Fee Realty and WebDigs.com, which was uh, like Redfin. Um, I acquired them. They were great. I'm going to make millions. These are the next best idea. They tanked. Nobody wanted to rely on themselves. They became more dependent on a real estate agent than ever. So it's very important that we keep the humanistic approach in our business as you guys do in real estate because Redfin, all these guys, they're not making any money. Yet Remax, Coal Banker, and these full-service human being businesses, they're making still all the money. So, uh, And I should clear up something. That 79 bucks is just for me to manage the property. Everything I do is a la carte, which actually is a value proposition. Most of my competitors require you to lease, manage, and, and you got to sign long-term commitments with them. We don't have any of that. You can hire me just to lease. You can hire me just to manage. You can cancel at any time. There's no cancellation fees, month-to-month contract. So we make it easy. We make it worry-free. So if we don't do a great job, you let us go. So there's a lot of value proposition there. We also have trademark services like those risk protection programs that you can't really get elsewhere. Um, But we'll charge upwards of one to two months rent to place a tenant in a property. Mm. But we provide a lot of value now. I'm going to guarantee your tenant is going to pay rent for nine months in some cases 12 months or even up to 18 months if they sign a longer term lease. And if they don't, I owe you a new tenant completely free. Uh, and so there's some value proposition to that. And so uh, there's no fees up front. There's no marketing fees. There's no lease signing fees. It's just if and when I bring you a tenant that I'll warranty and guarantee, would you agree to pay me a commission of one month's rent or two months rent if it's a three year lease? 
everybody says absolutely without a doubt. And then on top of that, it's non-exclusive. So go hire a REMAX agent. Go hire another leasing agent. And whoever gets the job done first, that in the client's best interest, gets paid. Wow. And that's how we work. We still don't have that uh, exclusive relationship, yet 99% of our clients are pretty much exclusive with us. But they just don't like, they like knowing the idea that if you guys suck, I can fire you and I don't have this 12-month contract. I think it's, we just, we changed a lot of the, we listened to what they wanted and what they didn't want it and we created the company around it and that's what became Renner's Well. Got it. That's cool. So, so just so I understand, Brenton, um, you know, so you have an a la carte menu of services. So, so if I want you to place a, uh, you know, put a tenant in my house, you'll do it. Uh, you're going to charge me one yep. to 2%. Um, it, it, one to two months rent. One to two months rent. Okay. Sorry. Um, wh- what about if I say, Hey, I want you to guarantee the performance. Is that, do I pay? Is that like insurance? Is that like, am I paying? It's kind yeah. of like, okay. We have some insurance products that, um, uh, were, we, they were currently warranty plans under a lot of states now and some states they're becoming insurance products. So we're going through a retool, but, uh, yeah, we've had guaranteed rent product where if your tenant doesn't pay the rent, our insurance company will pay the rent for up to six months, uh, with low to no deductibles. We have products that say that we'll cover up to $100,000 of accidental tenant damage. Wow. Um, fire, smoke, uh, intrusions in the wall. They drive. We've got that covered in a deductible, $0. Cost 20 bucks a month. Is it, well, well, um, well, hold on, hold on. Is that an internal product or do you, it's, you know, or, I mean, are you, is that your a, money? You're, it's you're a private to label me? product that we, okay. uh, we okay. partnered with an insurance company. And then, you know, in a, in a month or so, we might, it, it'll probably most likely just be ours. Uh, we're, we're deciding to become a, an insurance company as well as a property management company because our insurance products are so, um, uh, well, we thought they were warranty products, but a recent audit has gotten us in a little trouble. So we're going through retooling. And as a result, it's actually going to afford us the opportunity to become our own. Uh, insurance company and sell proprietary products with the the, the partnership of uh, a very large insurance company underwriting us. Got it. So yeah, I mean that's a huge product. And then we have the eviction protection product, which uh, for ten bucks a month, if your tenant gets evicted, we write the check. We go to the housing court, we get them out, we we'll move in a new tenant. And if you're under warranty, that means we'll pay. We'll, if you're under warranty, meaning the tenant didn't last nine months, let's say six months in, they get evicted. Well, we pay for the eviction. Let's say they left ten thousand dollars of damage, we pay for the damage. And let's say because it was in six months, we owe you a new tenant for free. Go to your REMAX agent. Go to any other agent in the country and tell them your tenant just, you know, stop paying rent six months in and ask them what they'll do. We right. pay for the damage. We cover the rent. We go, we go and uh, get them evicted, and then we give you a free tenant. Now, I can't do that if one out of five of my tenants go bad. None of my tenants go bad. I mean, we have like one-tenth of one percent of my tenants get evicted nationwide because of of a proprietary screening and marketing process that gives us a, a massive pool of applicants. For example, when I rental prop, when I put a property on the rental market, we don't have an MLS generally. In fact, most of my offices do not use the MLS whatsoever for rental properties. We put them on a series of 220 plus websites using our technology called Rent Feeder, where we can syndicate our ad to all the major sites, Truvia, Zillow, uh, Realtor.com, Rentals.com, you name it. We get premium placement. And as a result, that gets us thousands of leads that allow us to rent the property faster and perform more money. Got it. Okay. We only have a couple minutes. And then there's, I have so much stuff I want to – normally these interviews are an hour long. You actually got on a weird one of my other calendars, and we only have 30 minutes. I have another call. So, so look, really quickly, Brenton, one – what I mean, look, I, you guys are going public. I mean, that's got to be your, your goal here, right? That's one of our exit strategies. Um, it is one of our exit strategies. Um, we'd also like to get the attention of uh, one of the greatest franchisors in the game, Realogy. Uh, they did look at us when we were selling to the private equity groups. And uh, we, you know, once we turn this into a quarter of a billion dollar business, we'll, we'll talk to them again or we'll go public. So we have, uh, you know, we want to become a quarter of a billion dollar revenue business in the next uh, 36 months. We have every intention to do that, and when we do, we're going to go public. We're going to sell. Wow, that's amazing, man. Um, okay, so so I have to. So you know, uh, you mentioned how many units do you have under management right now? You mentioned a number earlier. We have ten thousand individual properties okay. in twenty eight states, um, and six thousand of those actually are just in Minnesota. So the other four thousand are part of a recent uh, year expansion plan through franchising. Um, and now we're opening in Austin, uh, Seattle, and Portland as corporate locations here almost immediately. Okay. So here, here's my question. With t- you have 10,000 units. Uh, you have investors buying and selling all the time. Are you going to start a real estate division or how, how, do, how do you deal with those, those, those investors? I'm glad you asked that. Yeah. I, 
I had a real estate franchise brand called RW Realty that had been in development for two years. We had completed it. We had built out an amazing website. Um, in fact, anyone wants to check it out, it's only going to be up for a little bit longer. It's RW Realty 360. It's an amazing new real estate company that we invented to be the little brother, little sister of Renner's Warehouse. However, last week we decided that we are going to close that division of our business, albeit very doing very well, because we believe it alienates us from some of our best real estate referral sources, real estate agents. We believe we should sell more of our best sellers and try to diversify into the real estate business. Uh, and so we're going to focus on corporate locations doing just Renner's Warehouse, and we are taking our managing director and our managing broker from RW Realty, and he's going to now become our business development leader of real estate agents. So we're not going to get into the traditional buy-sell or even flat-fee real estate business. We're going to become the world's greatest professional landlords, and that's it. Got and we're going to partner with the world's greatest real estate agents to help us do that. And, and I looked at that site. Um, is, is this a Boomtown site, Brenton? It is Boomtown. Isn't that, isn't that amazing technology they have? Yeah, yeah. I know. That I, we have to turn it down. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know Greer. Greer's... We just put it up. We just completed that thing, too. I'm really proud of what they did over there. Yep. No, they did a good job. Um, okay. Um, so it covered agents. They just raised a bunch of money, by the way. $15 yep. million dollars by a private equity group, they're going to become big time as well. I really like what they're doing over there. I, I agree. I think they're doing some interesting stuff. I don't, I don't, I don't get their end game though. I don't, I, I, I have to think that those, you know, so you, you raise 15 million at, you know, a, what a $50 million valuation, um, $45 million, but you know, whatever, 30 to 50. Um, I, I, you know, are they looking for an acquisition from Zillow or Trulia or, I mean, what? I don't know. I don't know. What... You know, their, their game is twofold, right? They got proprietary uh, user interface. That's really clean, really good for collecting and, and uh, processing leads. And then they're, they're quite good at the real estate PPC and SEM game specifically as it relates to their site. Uh, and they make money in managing, you know, campaigns for soliciting leads and they make money by building you know, a really great lead capturing site. Um, and so I think they got two fingers in the cookie jar, right? They're getting a premium hosting fee. They're building premium websites. And then they, uh, they manage your spend so that you can use that site to its fullest. And I'm an expert in SEO. I'm an expert in PPC and all of that. And I put them to the challenge of why I wouldn't use my internal team that we have lots of amazing people doing. And, uh, you know, they impressed us. They really do have a secret sauce that we can't compete with even at my level. And uh, we did decide to go with them. That's been up for six months. It's been a success. I'm a little annoyed that we have to take it down because that was one of the better pieces of uh, our online lead gen. That was really working great. But, you know, we were doing radio. We were doing, we were doing predictive marketing. Uh, we were actually able to start, start predicting of people who would sell six months, a year ahead of time based on some, you know, the herd effect and other things, 200 different factors. So we were really inventing something cool. And uh, we're going to put that on the back burner and probably try and, you know, help all the real estate agents take some of that technology that we built that we know works and use it as a way to get in with them so they know that we're committed to getting out of the real estate game and staying the best in the property management game, but yet helping them grow their business so they can help us grow ours. Yeah, Brenton, I wish I had more time with you. So, so, so just real quick on that predictive, because I think, we're, we're, was that something you did internally or were you using like a smart zip? Well, we've used smart zip. That's what got us on the idea, but then we started doing something intern, uh, internally and uh, proprietary, something that we basically we took best practices from what SmartZip did. And I'll tell you, um, I wasn't a fan of SmartZip yep, and I neither. had very little success. Uh, and I, I bought the rights to Minnesota for a year and I, I had very little success, but there were some key elements that were great. And, and we incorporated that into some of our rent feeder technology and some of the Boomtown technology. And, and I think it was our special blend of it that actually started to have traction. Uh, not as much traction as some other things, but it had traction enough where we were going to invest in that pretty heavily to see where it could go. But I don't recommend smart tip. They were really reasonable to deal with. Uh, they're really professional. And my market was Minnesota. I had very little success. I've heard of others who've had great success. So I don't want to rain on their parade. But just do your due diligence. Check them out. You know, I didn't have success. Others had. I, I can tell you that very few. I, I talked to a lot of people in the show, Brenton. I, very few people have had success. I, I don't think they're going to be around for, for that much longer. Look. I got to let you go just really quickly. I always ask for a book recommendation. What does a guy oh, yeah. like you read, Brenton? Man, I don't read many books. So take my referral highly because I hate books. I don't have the time for them, but there are a few books that have changed my life. Uh, there's three of them real quick. Rework. It's a technology book written by Jason Fried, the inventor of Basecamp. Simple two page, three page chapters that revolutionized the way you think about business. Go and get it today. I've given out hundreds of copies to anybody that matters to me. 
And then the thing that's changed my business, that, that rework changed my personal mindset. The thing that's changed my business the most was a book called Traction, written by Gino Wickman. He helped me organize my business when I was a million-dollar business so that I could become a $30 million business. He gave me the tools, the thought process, the meaning agenda. He gave me everything I needed. He prepared me in a very simple way uh, to do that. And then the follow-up to that, which is round two of that book, is once you have traction, you need to get a grip. And that's round two, and that's utilizing the things you're taught in traction. I'm telling you, go to the bookstore, flip through it. They're one of these books where you can read a chapter in the bookstore, and you're going to see value right there. And that's how good of these, these books are. In fact, um, I'll give away five books on my LinkedIn page. If anybody wants to you know, mention your podcast, go to my LinkedIn page, say, say they love what they heard on, on our show today, and uh, I'll send them uh, a rework, a traction, or a get a grip. I'll donate five books to your fans. That's awesome. That'll be great. Now, and we have a very, very big Twitter following. Are you on Twitter, Brenton? I am on Twitter. Uh, I'm, I'm very political on there. Go and find me at Brenton Hayden. Okay. Otherwise, my business is pro landlord. Perfect. Well, listen, everybody, if you want to get a copy, I mean, go, look, go, go, go say thank you for Brenton. He's a busy guy. Took the time out to come and share with you guys. Um, if you want to get some of those books that uh, a guy like Brenton is recommending, Rework, Traction, or you need to get a grip, you know, you can use our Audible link. Always just go to audibletrial.com slash Super Agents Live. There you go. Hey, Brenton. Hey, man, I really wish I had more time with you. Maybe we can do a follow-up. I really appreciate you taking the time out, man. Let's do it again, man. This was fun. Uh, it was really uh, my pleasure. So thanks for having me on your show. Thanks, buddy. Talk to you soon. Bye now. <clears throat> okay, so this is episode. Well, this is this is um, this is uh, not episode. This is what this is like the second part. This is part two of this twofer. So uh, you heard Brendan Hayden talk about his uh, about his uh, building his business. Now, and look, Brenton is a pretty, um, um, you know, you could hear him, me and him, like, you know, we're going back and forth pretty quickly. He's a pretty dynamic guy. Now, my next guest, and literally, literally, like, these calls were back-to-back. I hung up with Brenton, dial the phone to get my next guest, Matt Johnson. Now, Matt is very different than that. He is much slower, um... Which is not bad. That's just his personality. It's just, I'm just telling you kind of how I have to deal with these people. So much slower, uh, more long-winded. And what you'll see if you if you listen, you, you hear me trying to cut him off a bunch of times uh, because I'm 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 pretty much saying, look, man, you didn't get to it. Let's let's get to it. So anyway, I'm not talking smack about him. Just in case you know, Matt. Matt's a good guy. Uh, we and 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 later I in this ep- in this part two series. Uh, I talked to him about about his uh, his speed of talking and all that. So anyhow, um, uh, hopefully you get a sense of what I deal with to try to keep these episodes lively for you. All right. Hey, look, as always, um, um, send me an email. Happy to hear your comments, your feedback, whatever. Uh, let's get to it. And look, we, and, uh, and in this part two, we talk about luxury, how to crack the luxury market, what to do, what that guy would do if he's starting over again. And, and, and look, to be totally honest with you, there's nothing groundbreaking in this part two. And, and, um, but if you listen to it, what you'll hear is a lot of the stuff. It's, uh, I guess, social proof of what we've covered a billion different times. And uh, again, I'm not talking smack, so don't think that I am, because I would ne- I, I, I would have a hard time booking guests if I did. But I can tell you that because there's nothing groundbreaking in this episode, I probably wouldn't have aired it. It just so happens that I had two 30 minutes back to back, and I said, well, let's put them together. All right, hey, let's get to it. Today in the show, um, I'm excited to have today's guest. Now, today's guest is a little bit like you guys, uh, probably, because you know he doesn't have a team. It's, it's him, and he's got an assistant. Where he differs from you guys is that uh, he's on the luxury side. Um, he does equestrian properties in Wellington, Florida, r- around Palm Beach. I'm thrilled to welcome Matt Johnson. Hey, Matt, thanks for taking the time out. No problem. All right. So, so listen, I've given the audience, you know, a, a nuts and bolts overview of what you're doing, but take a minute, tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll get into, yeah, you know, what's working for you, what's not working. Yeah. Uh, basically I've been in real estate for, uh, going on 18 years. Um, so kind of ridden the, the tide from, you know, when the market, uh, was kind of level and steady in the late nineties and then, took off so I rode the wave up and rode the wave down uh now on the you know on the way back up but um 
Mainly, I, I, you know, I have a bachelor's degree in animal science and small business management. Um, I'm also a competitive uh, horse rider. Uh, so I ride and compete show horses um, both nationally and interna- internationally, and that's my kind of niche in, of the market. So I specialize in equestrian properties and um, estate homes for, I would say, 90% of my business or 95% of my business is all uh, somehow connected to the equestrian um, market or, or yeah. Niche. Well, okay. So I mean, and, and that makes sense. I mean, I think a lot of people, a lot of people want to sell, you know, luxury because I mean, number one, price points higher. Number two, you know, they're nicer homes. You're not walking through, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand dollar beaters. Um, um, but you know, people invariably go, well, I don't know those people. How do I meet those people? So for you, is is, right. the, is the fact that you are a writer and you're in, that is your world? Is that you're in? Yeah, I mean, that's my kind of was my segue into into the business. So I, I kind of already had that built in network from the beginning. OK, um, you know, it, t- it took a few years for people to, you know, feel comfortable and feel like that I had experience in that, you know, uh, in that business. But um, over time and with advertising and exposure and people seeing that, you know, the transactions that I was doing, that um, the comfort level came and then my business just continues to grow from that um well, well let me so, ask you right you know right now yeah no that right. makes sense so let me ask you this uh matt you know for that person you know i'm in san diego so you know for that person who's in san diego they're in la they're thinking about moving to la you know do, do you have any tips for them to you know how would how would somebody penetrate look let me ask it this way knowing what you know now matt how would you mm-hmm. penetrate this niche if you weren't already in it yeah, I mean, if it's the equestrian niche or whatever niche it is, you know, wherever you have your interests or, or, you know, hobbies or passions or network, whether it's through, you know, previous employment, um, it's tapping into that sphere of influence, as they say. Um, so, you know, I did a lot of it through, at the time, you know, print media and mailings and farming, uh, the different areas that I wanted to work in. Um, and just staying in front of those people constantly. Uh, so, you know, I picked out the, the neighborhood, the subdivision that I wanted to sell in, and I just stayed in front of those people through, you know, at the time, print and, and mailings were the thing of, you know, the way to do it. But, you know, now nowadays it's a lot of social media, internet stuff. So I would, I would focus my efforts on that and, you know, target the audience and the, and the, the listings that, you know, I wanted to obtain. So I, I, I chose to concentrate more on, on listings. You know, I feel that you have much more control of, of your destiny, your income when you, when you have the listings, because you, you can develop a relationship with the, the client and then, you know, you have them for a specific period of time. And, you know, most of the time I don't, if the listing does expire, I don't usually lose the listing. They renew just because I've developed a good enough relationship, a strong enough relationship with the with the client whereas with buyers i just feel it's a little bit more hit or miss and you know they can walk into an open house or they decide they don't want to buy or they decide they want to buy in a different area or a different city so it's uh i feel a little bit they're in a little less control in, the, in that situation so i chose to be specialize more on selling yeah you know, selling you know li- and, a listing agent sure and that's where you want to be right i mean everybody that's where you need to be is on on the listing side of it i mean that's the whole gary's kelly yeah. gary right you, you those who whoever owns listings owns the market but okay but you started with print because that was the thing that was out there um in today's environment in 2015 uh again knowing what you know now do, is print still a viable path uh, I mean, I've got, the way I look at print advertising is I look at it more as, uh, uh, you know, sellers want to see their properties advertised and it builds name recognition. So it's, I think a great listing tool. I don't think you're going to obtain your buyers necessarily through the, the print advertising. Um, you know, if there's a, if a buyer is serious and they're out there looking, they're already working with an agent, they're doing their research online. Um, they're either contacting the listing agent directly or, or they're working with an agent already and they do all of their research and, you know, the majority of it online. So they, they're already aware of what's out there. 
and it's, you know, at their fingertips on mobile devices, you know, iPads, their computer. Um, but as far as the print advertising, I think that's more of a, uh, a listing tool that, you know, gets your name out there for sellers. They see that you're advertising. Um, so I think that's the way to build, you know, name recognition and brand recognition. Um, and it's not, they're so not, to, not to cut you off. Yeah, not to cut you off, Matt. So, but here, here's here's specific yeah. my question. So, my question is this: You know, I know uh, again, I'm in San Diego, so we have La Jolla, we have uh, you know Rancho Santa Fe. I don't have a listing mm-hmm. there. I want to get listings. Mm-hmm. I want people to know that I can help them out. You know, would is it worth the money? Is it worth the time, in your opinion, to to create uh, a mailer? And you know some kind of print, and 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 I'm and maybe you're, maybe when you say print, I just realized maybe you're not talking about mailers. Are you talking about mailers? Are you talking about some uh, magazines? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm talking about mailers, okay. but I'm also talking about you know average, uh, you know, magazine ads, um, things like that. But what I when I did the print stuff and the mailings, that I did a mailing for you know once or twice a month. In the beginning, I was like doing it twice a month to the neighborhoods and the subdivisions, the that I wanted to be in and it, it takes, you know, you have to be consistent and you have to do it every month. And in the beginning I did it twice a month and then, you know, like maybe a year into it, I went down to like once a month, but you have to keep putting yourself in front of them. And then it it takes some time to build that, that trust and that recognition um, with the sellers um, and the homeowners. So then, you know, I think I probably got my first listing, you know, in one of those neighborhoods, you know, close to a year and a half, two years later. So it's not something that's, you know, you're going to see results right away. So if you only are going to do a few mailings, you know, once every few months, it's not going to work. Yeah. Well, and you I have to, you have to, you really have to be consistent and you have to be, you know, committed for the long haul. And then, then it kicks in. And then once you get that first listing in that neighborhood or that high end subdivision that you want to be in, it, it kind of takes off after that on its own it kind of you know the engine's running and and uh it just builds from there but it's that getting that first one or two listings in the neighborhood and then getting them sold that really what's going to drive your business from there on so hold on okay so let's say somebody some somebody takes somebody's listening to you matt and they're like okay according to matt you know i just got to get one and then it's going to take off what what, how do you leverage that, right? So, so maybe, and I guess here's what I'm saying. They probably go, you know, I don't have a year and a half to send out mailers. So I'm going to go yeah. knock on doors, which is perfectly fine. I'm going to go cold call these people, which is perfectly fine. So they do all this hard work. They get a listing. How do you leverage that listing to another and another and another? Yeah. I mean, you have to, once you get that listing, I mean, then you need to put it out there in front of everyone in in any and every way possible. So again, social media, you know, your Facebook business page, your, your personal Facebook page, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, you you need to mail it that you just listed it. You need to mail it when it's gone under contract. You need to mail it when it's sold. You need to put it in, you know, magazine advertisements, you know, that it was just listed and when you sell it, put it, you know, you know, a sold banner on it, you know, so you gotta, you have to use every possible avenue to reach, to reach those people. So if you're just doing one or two things, it's not enough. Okay. No, I, and I agree with you. Um, I, I, and I, 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 here's, I mean, I think in addition to all that stuff, right, you're, you know, obviously promote it everywhere. Hey, I just, just under contract, whatever, just listed. You know, I think that, uh, I think that you should hold open houses. I think that, you know, you know, I think that, you know, after you hold, hold an open house, uh, and you get it sold. Um, I think that, uh, for, well, Here's I'll, I'll get your t- let me ask you this. So the big mm-hmm. thing lately is these mega open houses. That's one thing. So so it's my listing. I'm gonna hold an open house, but it doesn't mean I'm gonna sell it, right? Uh, it doesn't mean I'm right. sorry. It doesn't mean I'm not. I'm gonna find the buyer. Somebody else could bring the buyer. Right. Um, the next new thing lately that I've been hearing is throwing the new owners uh, a, 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 a welcome home or you know congrat you know new home party. Um, uh. Have you ever have you ever played with that at all? Uh, honestly, I don't believe in open houses. That's my opinion. Okay. I, you know, I've I've done them. I've tried them. I think it's a waste of time. You have no control of, over who's coming into the house, whether they're qualified or not. Um, if it's a real buyer, a real buyer is already out working with an agent. So to be sitting in the house, you know, letting people walk through the door that you have no idea who they are. 
whether they're qualified, you know, usually it's a nosy neighbor or, you know, someone just driving by that wants to take a peek. But uh, I just find it a waste of time. I think there's better uses of of my time and my money and, and, and energy. Hold on. Um, as far as doing Wait, it. Let, let me, let me, just, let me, I agree with you. If you're trying, if you're holding an open house to find a buyer, I agree. It's a waste of time, but people, what people are doing, they're doing it and inviting the neighbors. They're, they're getting listing leads from these open houses, not buyer leads. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I think, I think there's better ways. Okay. This is my opinion. No, I mean, no, I've done no. them over the, over the years and, um, I think in 17 years, I've had one sell from an open house. Um, I think there's better ways to spend your time and money than, you know, sitting, sitting in the house waiting for people to show up. Well, that's my opinion. No, that's okay. I mean, again, you know, I mean, I, you know, you haven't had success. I mean, other people have, you know, it's just, and it could be just your market. It could be your niche. I mean, you, who knows? So, so yeah. what, uh, tell me some of those other ways. Cause again, we're talking about getting listing leads. So, um, we talked about some print. Uh, you, you're not a fan of open houses for listing leads. What, what's working for you right now after 17 years in this niche for you, Matt? Uh, the other, you know, the other thing that I've done quite a bit is, um, you know, to get, to get listings sold. I don't know if that's where you want to go with it, but, um, you know, I've done a lot of, uh, multiple luxury auctions, um, so that's that's great exposure for both the listing and the agent because um, it creates a lot of drama and interest around the property, and also you know it's a it's a a skill and a, an experience that most agents don't have or have any experience with. Well, and, it's and a great way to again, it's I, a I, great I, way to capture I, sellers that you know and listings that you know, maybe have been on the market for quite some time, but have they haven't you know, had any luck with getting it sold or offers. And it's a, it's a great marketing tool. Um, so ex great exposure, Matt, explain that for people because I, I agree that most people don't have this experience. Explain that to people. What does that look like for if people don't know? Um, well, oftentimes, you know, you, like with the high end luxury buyers, you know, or sellers, um, you know, property, can sit on the market, especially these really specific, unique properties or very expensive properties. You know, a lot of times the the marketing and the exposure is just very local based, and it it doesn't draw the largest pool of buyers. Um, you're just tapping into really the local market, and you're depending on um, that you're going to just capture someone locally to buy those properties. But a lot of these high end luxury buyers, these are you know multiple you know, a third, fourth, fifth home for these people or a vacation home. Um, you know, in my case, uh, with the equestrian properties, it's a very seasonal market. So people come from uh, all over the country, from Canada, from Europe, to ride and compete at, a, you know, a winter show circuit that's held in, in town. And um, so the, the luxury marketing platform um it's a much broader base. It's international. It's national. Um, you know, you, so it's it's attracting a much larger pool of buyers. And the best way to get the best price for your someone's property is to tap into a larger number of people. So if you're only tapping into a local local market or a local pool of buyers, you're not going to find the best buyer for that property. So I, I would agree with that. So again, I'm not sure that I completely understand what you're, how are you then? Cause you mentioned auctions. I thought you were going to talk about auctions. How are you doing auctions and then tapping buyers from out of market, out of country, whatever. That's through the, through the auction. Again, okay, let's back up. Tell us, let me let me kind of set the stage. So I had a guy in here, Danny Griffin. He he has an auction model. Um, he actually got a TV show from doing it um, called Sold in 60. And what he does is he has a property. He promotes, heavily promotes the property in multiple different ways, holds it open for two hour window. And he said, this is, and he tells everybody it's going to be open for two hours. That's it. Never going to be open again. He, he, uh, people walk in, they get information as they walk out, they submit their bid, right? It's literally done in, in 60 minutes um, and he gets it sold. So mm -hmm. what, what is your process for, for doing that? 
Well, the lux- lo- I mean, there's multiple luxury options throughout the United States. So, but basically, the format is it's usually a six a six to eight week uh, process once once the marketing hits. So it's TV commercials, radio, you know, international marketing, national marketing, Wall Street Journal, you know, all those top high end uh, media outlets. And then we do open houses for uh, usually about six weeks, two to, two to four days a week for four or five hours. Anyone can come through the property. And then there's a set date for the auction. Um, in order to, sh- to be a bidder at the auction, you have to put down you know, a sizable uh, deposit, good faith deposit. Um, and then they actually hold a live auction at the property. Um, and then the property is sold. And then whoever's the... Uh, um, the winning bidder has to put 10, 10% uh, escrow deposit down, and then they have to close within 30 days with no contingency, no financing, no inspection. Wow. If they want to inspect, they have to do it prior to. But, um, you know, prop, I, I had a property that, you know, was listed with multiple realtors over several years. I have had it listed for probably close to a year. We then decided to go the auction route, and we had the property. It was listed for seven point two. We had it sold for um, six eight two fifty within, um, you know, forty five days. Wow! Once we started the whole process, so it's it's a great way to move property. It's it's basically a marketing technique. It just creates drama around the property because people know, okay, this property is going to be sold on such and such a date, and then you know. People think, oh, they're going to get a deal or they're going to steal it, which is fine if that's what they think. But, you know, the more people that you have there that are there to bid and drive, you know, they drive the price. I mean, that one property that I just told you about, it sold in 60 seconds. So once we started the bidding, it was done in 60 seconds. Do, in your in your experience, Matt, I mean, do do people get steals um, or do properties typically go for, for market value? Uh, I've done four four luxury auctions, and all of them um, met or exceeded our our goal, um, you know, and the seller's goal for the price. So, I think most of the there's different ways to do the auction. There are reserve auctions where the seller sets like a, a reserve number, which is the lowest number he's willing to accept. I got it. Okay. For the property, if if the bid does not go over that or or, or reach that, then he doesn't have to sell it. He can if he wants to for that price, but he has the option not to accept it. Then there's also some companies that prefer to do an absolute auction, which is no matter what the, the final bid is, the property is gone. So if it's a $10 million property and the final bid is $2 million, that property is sold for $2 million. But you have to have a you know seller that's willing to take that risk and can stomach the process of, of that and can stomach the loss. A lot of sellers aren't uh, in that position or, or able to stomach that yeah sure i mean that's a tough that's you know that's a yeah you got to be a a warrior to be able to do that but if you have if if you're able to put a a reserve price on it it seems to me that that like it would be great exposure like like auction every single one and just put your you know you you set your reserve at you know your what you want to make yeah i mean the reserve has to be attractive enough so that people the way it works you know the only way it's going to work is if it it looks like they're going to get a deal or a steal. So if the, if the property's, you know, value is 10 million and you're offering a reserve of, you know, four and a half million, people are going to be, wow, you know, I could prob- possibly get this property for four and a half, five million, six million dollars, you know, oh, so, four so, million dollars under market value. So you don't, it, it can't be, the reserve number can't be so close to the value or the list price that, you know, that's not going to work because it doesn't create any drama or interest. So I got it. Whole, so, so, so everybody knows the reverse. It's not, it's not hidden like it is on eBay. No. Yeah. Okay. Usually the reserve, the reserves are published. I got uh, it. Okay. Numbers. So, okay. So they know walking in the door that once the bidding reach, let's say it's a $10 million property and the reserve is 4.5. They know that once the bid, bidding meets 4.5, that the property sold, it could still go up to seven or eight, but they know they have the potential of getting it for five or six. So, you know, the buyer walks in with a number in mind of how much he's willing to pay. And then he opts out of the bidding at, at whatever point he's, yep. you know, he's not, no he's not comfortable, comfortable, but so, but, okay. All right. Um, but, 
knowing, you know, you've been at this a while, what do you think is fundamentally different about operating in the luxury market rather than just the, the you know, the average, selling average price houses? Um, I mean, I think it, it's partly, you know, knowing the clientele, knowing how to handle, um, you know, certain types of individuals and personalities. Um, cause you know, a high net worth individual is a, a different type of personality and, uh, expect different things than someone who's buying a, a 200, 300, $400,000 home. Um, and they expect, you know, different level of service and knowledge than, than, you know, the lower end market. Well, okay. I mean, can, can you, can you unpack that a little bit? Um, yeah, I mean, it's just knowing, it's just knowing how to read personality and read, read personality types. I mean, the lower end market, you're, you're doing a lot more hand holding and walking them through the process. They, a lot of times it's their first time buying a home or they're not familiar with the mortgage process. Um, they're not familiar with inspections and appraisals. So it's, it's a lot of kind of babysitting where high, high net worth individuals, they've been through this before. They're very usually cut and dry, um, so it's it's a, a, a bit different that way. Um, it's it's a little bit um, less intensive work in some ways, but in other ways, you know, you have a, a lot of personality to deal with and egos to deal with. So sometimes it's just a, a matter of knowing how to hand, handle people and and move them in the right direction to close the deal. Okay. All right. No, that's fine. And, and let me ask you this. What, and we're going to start wrapping up here. What do you know now, Brenton, um, that you wish you would have known when you started? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't know. Probably just, you know, not, you know, not take things personally and, and just really, really real estate is about problem solving and trying to, you know, come up with solutions where everyone gets what they want um, and not being so focused on, you know, maybe the price or something like that, but to trying to find a middle ground with everyone. Um, okay. All right. Well, but, you know, I always ask for book recommendations. So, uh, so here's the setup. I'm an aspiring agent. I have 25 bucks. What book should I go buy today? <laughs> Uh, I'm I sh- not I sh- a big reader. So I know. I need to tell people. I need to tee people up for this one, I, and I don't. I need to do, start doing that. Um, I would probably probably suggest something on psychology or, or the psychology of you know buying and selling or or something like that, but or how ha- ha- how to handle you know different personality types. Okay. I think, I think you know. Most importantly, I see I see a lot of realtors fail because they don't know they they only know how to operate in one way and they only know how to handle people a certain way. And you have to be in real estate very flexible, and you have to be able to read different everyone's personality. And some people need hand holding, some people don't. Some people need to have their egos stroked. You know, others don't. So it's it's learning how to read people and and kind of knowing how to handle them. Some people need to be pushed. Some people don't like to be pushed. Some people, you know, want to beat you up. And if you let them, you know, they're going to run all over you. Other people need to be beaten up back. And then they're like, oh, I respect you now. So I think it's maybe a book on psychology, some type of psychology and how, how to handle different personality types. So that's fine. And so, and so for you, for you, did you look, let me, let me, I'll just, you know, I I don't, I'm going to say something about you personally. So don't, I don't, don't, I don't mean in any kind of offensive way, but just talking with you, you're relatively, you, you, you're, you don't seem to be an excitable guy. Um, you you know what I mean? Like you're, you're you're probably very even tempered. Um, how have you learned to, 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 you know, how have you learned this skill of, of, of dealing with all sorts of personality types, being, being the, the, the personality that, that I'm dealing with, that I'm hearing, right? I mean, you don't talk as fast as I do, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you, you, right. you, you know what I mean? Like, is that, how did you learn that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a very steady level, level personality, but, uh, you know, 
I, I know when I, I know when I have to push. I know when I need to be strong. I know when I need to be, you know, a little more verbal. And so, you know, some people people are surprised sometimes, like that. I, you know, someone may start to be unethical or or you know start to walk all you know try to walk all over me. And I have no problem standing up to someone and, and putting them in their place. But this, you know, I also think with my personality, you know, people trust me. They, they see I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a steady guy that I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not offensive. Um, and you know, it, 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 it's worked for me. So I am who I am. I don't change. I don't put on a persona or a sales persona just to try to, you know, get it done. You know, there's yeah. realtors in my area that are like used car salesmen, right. salesmen and they're pushy, you know, and it's, that's just not my style. So you have to find what's your style and you have to be authentic. And I think if you're authentic, then that comes through and then people trust you and, and, uh, you know, are willing to put their assets and, and their homes and, um, yeah, yeah, I mean they're gonna trust you. Give you the job. Yeah, give you the job. But if they at any time feel that you're you're fake or lying or or you know manipulating them, you know, then then you've lost you know your client. You've lost their trust, and it's just you know my my best advice would be you know be yourself and not try to be something that you think you should be. And and I think I, but know, I, for I, some I, pe- for some people, you know, some people want a pushy pushy realtor and, uh, or salesperson and, and that, and that may work for them. But, you know, for me, that's not my style. That's not, you know, it's not the way I operate. Yeah. But, and I think, right. And, I, and I, I, look, I can appreciate that. I, he, my, my sense is, and I, and we're going over, we're like, <laughs> so, so bear with me, but you know, my sense is, is that if I, if I have a $10 million house now, and again, if I have a $10 million house, I've pretty much paid cash for it. Cause you know, you don't, there's no tax benefits for, for that. Um, you know, right. I, I need a guy that's got the answers, right? I, I want a guy who's on the yeah. inside, right? I want a guy who's I, I fundamentally really slick, right? I want him. He's got to be part lawyer. He's got to be part finance guy. He's got to be part real estate guy. Um, yeah. So you, so you would agree with that. That's that if you're, yeah, gonna- I, I agree with that. I mean, you have to have, you know, experience in all of those things, but I, the one thing that I always say to my clients is there's nothing that I can say that the seller can say, or any other realtor that can say that's going to sell their house. Their house is going to sell itself. So my job is to navigate the process to help them navigate through inspections, any legal problems, you know, anything that arises. Basically my job is a problem solver, whether it's with financing, whether it's with inspections, whether it's with, you know, the advertising, um, maybe it's a divorce situation. So sometimes you're having to be, you know, a mediator between the husband and the wife or, you know, the, uh, the, you know, if they're at the corporate re- reload, you're having to work with the, co- you know, the corporation and the, the homeowner. So, you know, I, I don't think there's anything, any sales tactic or any tagline or, or anything like that, that the, a realtor can do that's going to make the difference. The property is going to sell itself. It comes down to being priced appropriately, being exposed to the market pro- appropriately, and then having someone that's able to negotiate the problems as they arise. And um, it's very easy, you know, one mistake in, in a pro- you know, not being able to solve a problem or, you know, that, that can blow the deal. Yeah. So it's no. really... Okay. Having having the experience in how to how to negotiate all of those obstacles, and if you know if you don't know or you make a mistake, then it's very easy to ruin the deal over a simple simple thing. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Well, hey, uh, Matt. Thanks, buddy. Um, I always encourage my audience if they've got anything out of this to reach out and say thank you to you. Uh, where can people find you, Matt? Uh, my website's matt at mattsells dot com. Um, and I'm also on Facebook, Matt Johnson, Realtor. Um, you can search by my my website. Well, and oh, hold um, on, Matt Sells, MattSells.com. So, well, let me ask you that, MattSells.com. Is that for the high end? Uh, has that branding 
been hurtful to you or, or, or you know what I mean? Like it, it seems like, you know, platinum no. properties, you know, Matt, so just Matt sells. Like, do you think that is appropriate for a high end uh, luxury property? Well, this is what, what I find, you know, I, you really have to leverage your website, whatever your website is, you need to leverage it Yep. in your advertising and your media. And I'll meet people that I've never met before. You know, even if it's just, a, you know, through a friend and, uh, they'll be like, Oh, this is Matt Johnson. They're like, Oh, is this Matt sales.com? You know, so they, it, it just comes to their mind the minute they, you know, they hear my name. They're like, Oh, Matt sales.com. Got it. So it's, yeah, it's worked for me. I mean, if it's, you know, platinum luxury, uh, homes or, you know, Diamond, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's kind of, kind of general, but when they hear my name or like, Oh, this is Matt Johnson. They're like, Oh, Matt sells. Oh, you're okay. so, you know, I get that all the time. So it, it, yes, it has worked for me. Okay, perfect. No, I love it. I love, I mean, I, I, um, and again, just last question, just your opinion. What, what about like a Matt sold it? Did you think that would play as well as Matt sells? Um, I mean, I guess whatever, I, it's, again, I think it's about leveraging it and, and getting it out there that so that it's recognizable. So Matt sold it, what, whatever it is, um, you know, luxury mat or, you know, it, right. I don't think it's, but if it's, if it's just general, like luxury properties or luxury, got it. you know, like it's not specific enough to me. I think, you know, having my name part of it, you know, was helpful. Okay. No, I, I, I think that's going to be helpful. I mean, to, to people out there. And I think, you know, looking at your website, I think one of the more important things that you have here, you got Matt Johnson, equestrian and estate home specialist. That's the thing that I, that I think right there where people, if they land on this, like, okay, I get it. This is what this guy does. So, hey, hey Matt, listen, right. I'll be the first guy to kick off that thank you train. Thanks, man. I know you're a busy guy. I know we had to reschedule this one. So I, I do appreciate you taking time out of your busy day and, uh, you know, sharing with me and my audience. I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Anytime, buddy. All right, let's keep in touch. All right. See you, buddy. Take care. Let's go.